the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here at once, take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, put on your apron, serve me while I eat and drink, later you may eat and drink? Do you think the, thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we have done only what we ought to have done. This is the word of the Lord. When I was a little boy and would get my hair cut, the barber would hold up a bottle of green stuff and a bottle of red stuff and say, you want some Roy Rogers or some Gene Autry? I preferred Roy Rogers. But on the way home, driving out to the gas camp where I grew up, there were a series of signs along the way, and I learned to read them. Always a little joke right at the end, and with Brill Cream, a little dab will do you. I thought about that when I read this text, because this is about faith, how much, how little, more. Let's take a look. If you had faith as big as a mustard seed. Two years ago, Gail and I were reading this travel guide for France, written by graduate students from Yale University. And it said, you really should see how they make Dijon mustard. It's interesting. Go on, spend a few euros, a couple of hours, learn how to make mustard. So we went. Uh, they gave each one of us a mortar and pestle, and then they dropped a few little seeds in. They were tiny little black seeds, and we were to first moisten your finger, put five or six of them in your mouth. They were almost tasteless. Then they said, now grind them, grind them. And then they poured something into our little mortar. And they said, these are the last squeezing of the grapes. The first squeezings make wine. And right down at the bottom, they pour them into the mustard seed. And that chemical reaction between these last squeezings from the grapes and those tiny little seed make what you and I know to be Dijon mustard. Even that much faith. Now, Mark doesn't have this little story. Luke and Matthew do. They're looking at a common source, scholars are convinced, called by the Germans the Quella. And as they see this, both write exactly the same words. He said, if you had faith even as big as a mustard seed, you would be able to. And Luke said, ah. They could ask this sycamore tree. Sycamore is not like our sycamores here in this country, more like mulberry trees in this country. So our newer translation says mulberry. Those trees grew to 60 feet in height, a tremendous root system. There was a rule in ancient Israel that one could not plant such a sycamore tree closer than 25 cubits to a cistern, about 37 and a half feet because the root might crack the cistern. Luke says you could order that one of those trees be just uprooted and tossed out into the Mediterranean. Matthew said, hey, how about a mountain? You could just ask God to throw that mountain out in the Mediterranean. He could do it. Faith is a noun. First of all, it is a noun, a decision made. That moment described when you decided there was something that could be trusted. Gail and I were on a tour bus going into Uppsala, Sweden. And I said to her, uh, the program says we're about to have a coffee break. I'm going to see if I can see the grave of Dag Hammarskjöld. She said, okay. So the tour director said, all right, it's five minutes till 10. I'm giving you till 10.30 for everyone to get bathroom stop, 
got a cup of coffee, maybe a pastry, back on the bus at 1030. I whispered to her, where is the cemetery where Dag Hammarskjöld is buried? And she said, the little street that goes to that cemetery is too narrow. We cannot take this 44 passenger bus down that street. I said, where is the cemetery? She said, well, it's a really hard 10 minute walk. And I said, where is it? <laughs> and she told me and I said, I'll be back at 1030. So I ran, I ran. When I got to the cemetery, I looked frantically for somebody who could tell me where the grave was because everything was in Swedish, of course. And I finally saw a little lady over behind one of the markers with a hoe cleaning up. I rushed over her and finally helped her understand Dag Hammarskjöld. Ah, and she led me to his grave. Dag Hammarskjöld was the second secretary general of a very young United Nations. He was shot down, many believe, in a plane September 1961. I was in college. A few months later, we would be in the throes of the Cuban Missile Crisis without Dag Hammarskjöld. We had American forces on Cyprus at the time that said they intercepted a radio communication say, we got him plane crashed as he was flying to a country in Africa to negotiate a riot between two factions of people. Some did not want peace to come. Many believed the plane was shot down. All 13 on board died. President John F. Kennedy said, this man was the greatest diplomat in the 20th century. And the Nobel Peace Prize officials elected him to receive posthumously the Nobel Peace Prize. I stood at his grave and thanked God for him. Shortly after his death, people were going through, inventorying his apartment in New York, not far from the United Nations headquarters, and they found a diary that he had kept for 25 years. It wasn't the kind of diary that said I got up at six and I had breakfast and then I, you know, the kind of stuff people tweet to each other. No, this diary was about how he felt about things, you know, how he felt about things. He had grown up in the Lutheran Church of Sweden, and this is what he wrote in his diary that would be published called Markings. It was a bestseller when I was in seminary. And at one point he says, for some years I questioned the faith of my childhood. And then I came to a new awareness and belief that the one who created the heavens and the earth was working mightily within those who were willing to bring peace and goodwill to the planet. Faith is trusting that that is so. It is a moment, the audacious yes, one theologian said, when we finally say, I believe the one who created the heavens and the earth knows my name. I am his son. I am his daughter. He wants good to come to me. Number two, faith is also a verb. In fact, I had a professor that said we should use it as a verb. You faith this and faith that, but it's a little strange in English. We do have a synonym, though, that we use as a verb all the time, and it's the word trust. Faith is something you do with whatever faith you have, even the size of a mustard seed. Jim Hinch is a novelist. He's married to an Episcopal rector in San Jose, California. They have a five-year-old daughter, two-year-old son. Jim has written that one afternoon late, his wife was still at work, he decided to take the two children to the city park in San Jose. He said the five-year-old was running around, I was trying to keep up with her, pushing the stroller with the two-year-old, when suddenly he said, I saw my little five-year-old stoop over a beautiful rose, 
take in a big breath and say, oh, it's beautiful. He said she started off again, and I was behind her with the stroller when my two-year-old was jerking on the front of this thing saying, Mel, Mel. And I understood he wanted to smell the rose. So I pushed the stroller right up as close as I could. Then I squatted down and leaned one of these over toward his face, and he stuck his nose right down into it and then said, Mmm. But I was close enough to him to know he didn't inhale, he exhaled. He didn't smell a thing. He didn't smell a thing. But as we went on through the park, I thought, but if he keeps doing the right thing, he will one day get it right. If you keep doing the right thing, one day you will get it right. Faith is something we do. We act on that decision. For Dag Hammarskjöld, he was flying all over the world trying to help God bring peace and understanding everywhere he could. Number three, this is a life that's supposed to be lived whether anybody ever thanks us or not. We know that for several hundred thousand years, human beings were hunters and gatherers. They killed and ate what they could catch, and they watched to see when berries were ripening or when grains could be used to make some kind of bread. But there came a time when they learned how to domesticate their animals so they didn't have to go hunt them and how to till the soil. The Israelites had come to that place. In Jesus' story, he makes that clear. Which of you who has a doulos, it says in Greek, a doulos can be slave or servant. Which of you has a servant who's plowed all day or tended the sheep all day and comes in, says to him, oh, please, you've worked hard all day. Please wash your hands and get ready for supper. I'll have it ready in a moment. No, you say instead to him, wash your hands, put on the apron, get my supper. Where have you been? Because he's already asked them on another occasion, Jesus, I mean, who's greater, the one who sits at the head table or the one who waits on tables? He understood the answer was the person at the head table. And he said, I'm among you as one who waits on tables. And he expects us to wait on tables too and to do it well whether anybody ever says thanks or not. Brad Meltzer is a writer. You may be familiar with the title Heroes for My Son. He wrote also Heroes for My Daughter. He's written five novels at this time. The last one was called The Fifth Assassin. Brad Meltzer has written that he grew up in Brooklyn, New York. He was 15 when his father got transferred to Florida. Can you imagine what that was like to a 15-year-old? I lived in Brooklyn. We didn't have a car. You got on the subway or you rode your bike. In Florida, he said, it was all about how you looked in a bathing suit on the beach. Were you a great football player or not? I was not, he said. I was little, thin, wore thick glasses. Scared to death when I went to school. My English teacher was a tall African-American woman named Miss Spicer. She began the first few days, assigned us a paper. When we got our papers back, she said just before the bell rang, Mr. Meltzer, I'd like to see you after the bell. The bell rang, everybody moved on to the next class, and she said to me, Mr. Meltzer, you can write. You can write. You should have been in the honors program. It's probably too late now to rearrange your whole schedule. So I'm going to teach you the honors curriculum. When I write assignment for all the rest of your class, just ignore it. When the bell rings, I'll put your assignment on a note 
into your hand. This is between you and me. I'm giving you the honors course. Brad said, her encouragement and help changed my life. So after I'd written and been published, I decided to go back to Florida and thank Miss Spicer. I Googled her, found out she was still teaching, but was coming to retirement. I went to Florida, one of my books in hand, dedicated to her. Sat down right near the front as wonderful people said nice things about her. She looked older. She was very quiet. I looked right at her. I could tell she didn't recognize me. She hadn't really seen me since I was 15. Now I'd lost all my hair. Otherwise, a little rounder face than before. She didn't recognize me, I could tell. But when finally the accolades were over and she stood to speak, she said to all these educators, you know, you may teach for 35 or 40 years, and no student ever come back to say thank you. But don't give up on these kids. Some of you say that these kids are different from the ones you taught 30 years ago. I tell you they are not. Different things are happening to them. They live in a different world, but these kids deep inside are the same kids you taught 35 years ago. Don't give up on these kids. He said, when they cut the cake, I walked up and said, Miss Spicer, yes, I'm Brad Meltzer. You changed my life. You changed my life. And she said, thank you. Thank you. You're the first one who's told me that in 35 years. I appreciate it. Jesus said you may go a long time before anybody ever says, thank you. Just keep on plowing. Just keep on tending sheep. Just keep on cooking supper. That's what God expects from you, the best you got. Number four, Dr. Fred Craddock says, note how this passage begins. Luke writes, the apostles said to the Lord. He said, notice here, most of the time Luke calls those who are following Jesus disciples. Here he calls them apostles. The word may refer to the same people. The words don't mean the same. Disciple means learner. Apostle comes from a verb meaning to send out, apostello. Most of the time, Luke calls them learners. Now he calls them those sent out because he has in mind not only those first ones who followed Jesus, but his own generation, those to whom he's writing all these years later. And then notice what he calls Jesus. He doesn't say the disciples asked Jesus. It says they asked the Lord. Luke knows he's been raised. He has been crucified, but he has been raised. And he wants all of his generation who are reading his book to know this is the resurrected one, the crucified one. Ask him for a little more faith, and he'll tell you to use what you got. The Paytons, who bring the Broadway series to Tulsa, have announced that next summer the Lion King is coming back again. The last time the Lion King was brought here from Broadway, it played night after night to standing room only for a month in Tulsa. It's coming back. I read recently something written by Brock Kidd. Uh, Mr. Kidd is an investment banker, has been for almost 20 years, but he's also the son of a Presbyterian preacher. And he knows the language of the church, of course. He had taken his 12-year-old son to see the Lion King. And on the way home, 
he said, his 12-year-old asked, Dad, how could Simba mess up so many times and then become a great leader? And I said, maybe he finally realized that the best of his father was also in him. 